Today I had an appointment with a lady who does this hair analysis which gives epigenetic information. And I went there and I was there at 10 and I thought my appointment was at 10. But it was at 10.30 and I called her assistant and said my name. He didn't even have me on the computer. And then he said, oh, it's double booked, but he still didn't say it was me that was double booked. So it was just really confusing. I don't know what he actually saw on his screen. And then I ended up leaving because I live close by, so I wanted to make sure the other person got in to see her, because I've seen her before for other things. She's really, really good. And uh, she said she'd give me a bit of a deal. I have an appointment next Wednesday now. But it just felt like glitch in technology scenario. Sometimes when I get to certain places in consciousness, or when certain levels of consciousness are filtering through me, technology stops working properly. I've had instances where I text somebody as me, but then that text turns into a text from somebody else on the other end and I say something and they're like, did you just text me blah 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 because it said blah 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 from blah blah blah. Long story short, it was just really confusing and I was like, whoa, I'm just in that place where where technology doesn't work and actually now that I think about it, I think it's the domain of the brain starting to work as a quantum computer because there's more possibilities existing at the same time. There's overlapping realities and and I feel like I go into that state to sort of resolve some of the overlapping realities that are possible, including maybe preventing people from dying in my reality. It makes it makes weird. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. I know what I'm trying to say, but it's being in a state of being identified with consciousness, not with the body. And so the consciousness is rearranging things and rearranging bodies because consciousness is filtered through bodies. So I think I did talk before about how it's a quantum computation state. And so it's confusing because there are multiple realities overlapping simultaneously. And it's odd because when one gets to that state where multiple realities are overlapping simultaneously and they're perhaps able to be in higher states of consciousness and choose a different path, reality collapses the wave function around the person being mentally ill as opposed to maybe collapsing it around them being a shaman or a mystic or so many other things that happen in other cultures or are even possibilities within our culture if we start to see it and frame it in a different way. And the thing is that as individuals get to those higher states of consciousness and have to go back down, if they were able to stay up, all of reality would have to level up and then lower levels of consciousness would be edited out. And that means people get edited out. And with this glitch today, I sort of realized that there could be two realities. Like in one reality, he put me in the computer and in the one he's in now, he didn't put me in the computer and he doesn't even remember me. So I remember that. But I think people, when they're in the level of programming, can actually forget those things. So the confusion exists in the one that remembers the two overlapping realities. And the person that doesn't remember is like, what are you talking about? You're just crazy. So seeing things from a higher perspective is confusing. And sometimes I have to be like, okay, well, that was kind of a glitch in the matrix for me. For them, it just was like, well, I don't think I put that in there. Not, and your name's not even in the computer on my side, yet I saw it in the computer on the lady's side who I was going to see. It's symbolic and part of it is material and part of it is communication. So at a different level of consciousness, it's actually hard to communicate with those at lower levels of consciousness because they're distracted. They're 
who knows, doing 10 things at once and then you try to say something and you think they actually get what you're saying and they don't. So it's difficult for different levels of consciousness to communicate with each other. It's really, it's really strange. I actually have a sense that the programs and the habits are actually like computer programs. Words and thoughts are like computer programs and they take us over those mind viruses and, and through the process of map consciousness, psychosis, mania, we're actually being decoupled from that computer programming and we're actually getting into a state where we're trying to relearn how to be humans and not rely on that programming because everybody's relying on that programming and then some of us go into a place where we're starting to practice n not being attached to that programming but then we eventually get captured and put into a different kind of programming for us to never again explore not acting based on our past programming and I feel like once we start to act in the moment not based on our past programming we're fully alive as human beings otherwise we're just alive as a biological phenomenon but we're not actually living life we're being lived by the programming we're just hosts to this programming I actually feel like like technology is more fundamental than biology and, and technology created biology and it's a matter of biology trying to be reborn out of the technology anyways I haven't really fully figured that out yet and it might be one of those things I don't want to figure out because I sort of realized I'm totally alone and I'm totally responsible and I think this is what we get connected with when we feel like oh I have to save the world and I have to do all this stuff it's because we're actually alone in our aliveness where's everyone sort of in their computer mind everyone is sort of like a computer with a screensaver up there's some processing going on in the background but it's not really awake I'm sure I'll go into that more later it's just something about this consciousness quantum computation and level of consciousness being funneled through biology and right now it's being converted into thought which is controlling us through habits and programs it's not being channeled into creating life it's not being channeled into being creative and so I did quit my job and I have two weeks to go so I will have to do some more work in these next two weeks so I might not have much time to talk to myself but I feel I need to talk to myself at least half an hour a day and then it takes half an hour to edit that so that's an hour a day whereas if I make an hour and a half of stuff that's three hours and that might be a little too much right now but I just want to remind myself that it's good to at least talk to myself somewhat especially because these two weeks will be pretty intense in terms of thinking about the mental health system which is a lower level of consciousness than I want to be a channel of and for California I'm thinking of making a medical ID tag bracelet and you can type in stuff online of what you want it to say and so I typed in some stuff that's sort of like a spoof medical ID and I'll insert the picture here.
What do you think? Should I do that? Do you think anyone will understand what that means? I won't do it that way, that wouldn't be good. But I do want to write something on it that is a little bit out there, but not too out there because the purpose is still for me to get help if I need it. If I go too far into the quantum domain and get afraid because I'm there all by myself, then computer people will come and rescue me and, and medicate me back into this reality. And that's fine. I was thinking about a symbol for a trans-conscious neurotribe. And so I created a sticker with this website because I looked up Rainbow Brain because the Autism Neurotribe has a rainbow infinity symbol as their symbol for their neurotribe. And so I was thinking, well, what about a brain that's a rainbow color? So I found that, and then it was a website that you can create stickers. So I created a sticker, and it has a brain that is rainbow, and then it's in the shape of a heart around the brain. So the rainbow brain and then the heart and the background is black. And then I put in this writing over top of the brain, trans conscious altruists. And I don't know if that's a good name. I'm sure there could be infinite names to describe it, but basically it is talking about how consciousness can be trans. One can identify as one's ego self or one can identify as the self or consciousness itself or the whole or or oneness or whatever the heck you want to call it and I like the altruist part because part of that I feel is that it's a state where we get in connection with altruism because we see we're all one so it's not oh I need to be altruistic it's that's how we are innately when we see that we are one and altruism is is selfless service and that itself acknowledges that we don't have a self we don't have an ego it's a necessary construct as part of programming and and maybe we need it in order to operate in the programming of society we need to be aware of those programs in order to somewhat operate and actually that could be part of the struggle of autism is that the brain can't be programmed in that way with language with word viruses so it's difficult for them to operate in society which is just based on programs on on all these constructs that we've been given and, and they have difficulty with them and I think that that's part of the evolution of consciousness is to not be able to be programmed in that way whether it's through the trans conscious process later in life or whether it's by being born on the autism spectrum and it seems like consciousness is starting to edit out the programming it's almost like it's saying, okay, we don't need these programs anymore. We needed them in order to create these structures, but now, now it's become too much. We have to actually put the humanity back in all of these structures that we've created. It was great to be able to, to build it all, but now we need that humanity. And Temple Grandin wrote a book called The Unwritten Rules of Society because she saw all these rules that she could see, but they're not written. And I don't think they're written because they're programmed into us. But she couldn't be programmed with them, so she had to actually observe what these rules were of society to live by. So in the same way, what I'm saying is a trans-conscious trans -conscious person can still appear to operate as if they have an ego, this solid ego, and maybe they do have some to a certain extent, but it's not really solid. It's more convenience to actually interact with the programming of society. And then one and then when one isn't in society, one doesn't need to be actually 
believing in those programs. I'm wondering if the light body version of a person is their non-programmed version, and that's always there as the original trajectory. And then the programming writes over that, and that can be eliminated in an instant. And I remember how I looked at this woman at 7-Eleven and she turned into her flamboyant version of herself. And then I looked away and looked back and she was back to that old sort of tired out, worn out person version of herself. So it's actually there. We're all living as that beautiful version of ourselves. It's just a matter of actually getting in alignment with that, which can happen in an instant. It doesn't take time. And there's nothing we can do to get there because it's already here. We actually just have to see the programming, really, and negate the programming. Like, that's just programming. Goodbye. And I feel consciousness is transitioning the brain. It's transitioning the brain out of that habitual programmed mode into more degrees of freedom of gesture and movement. And that is what it is to really be alive. Not to be programmed. Perhaps some of these are memes for a new neuro tribe. They're weems, they're not memes. Memes are about a separate me. And there is no separate me from life, there's we. I feel manic consciousness is partly powerful words, powerful memes, powerful weems from powerful observation. I wonder if first we have to be altruistic towards ourselves. Save ourselves first, sort of like in an airplane, you're instructed to put on your oxygen mask before helping others. Well, perhaps in trans consciousness, we have to put on our oxytocin mask before helping others. The inner human dimensions that compassion, that love, can't be programmed. And maybe it's the only thing that can erase the programming. I was thinking about how that woman I know visited me in the psych ward in April. And after her visit, my level of consciousness shifted upwards quite significantly. It could have been the accumulation of people visiting too. We're trying to transfer everything else besides the inner human dimensions that can't be programmed to the machines. So it's really important that as we create more technology and export these mechanical aspects of humanity to the machines, that we're equally able to reconnect with our inner human dimensions, the things that can't be programmed. And it's probably a complete reciprocal or inverse relationship that has to happen. Articulation creates neurons, articulating context. We have to learn how to not exist as habits, which just means we have to learn, because if we're learning, we're not being habitual. Map consciousness is brain puberty. It goes from the me circuits of the prefrontal cortex and dopamine to the we circuits of the whole brain and oxytocin in the body, which gets us actually realizing that we have a body. I might have talked about this before, but Amy Cuddy talks about the power poses and how standing a certain way for a few minutes can make us feel better. Well, imagine always being altruistic and always acting in oneness and always being kind. Those are actions, those are gestures, and those are gonna make us feel good too. And I think self-dialogue might make us feel better too. The gesture of self-dialogue could be an act of compassion and self-love, giving the brain a chance to talk to itself in a different way than we're used to. We have these repetitive thoughts happening and we don't actually activate a process, a, a, a conversation with ourselves, a dialogue with ourselves. 
and we're looking for our own brain we're looking for our brain to be active and to be growing and to be neuroplastic and the process of self dialogue helps with this and that's actually what we're trying to activate by all of our seeking when we could just sit here and talk to ourselves and then find when our brain actually turns back on properly that now we're more engaged in each moment of the day and there's nothing to seek because each moment is here with us when it arrives and that's all there is and this process of self-dialogue is making psychiatry obsolete for myself because I remember being in the psych ward and wanting to make that paternalistic psychiatry obsolete it's it can be helpful to have medication and things at times but to be paternalized like that is not helpful it's very detrimental it's the opposite of unconditional love so this process of self dialogue perhaps is helping me make it obsolete within my own neurology and I'm finding when I have conversations that what I say feels more powerful and empowering as it's more in alignment with what I've been talking to myself about which is how I would choose to think about things or the context I've created for myself to be able to uphold that I make oxytocin through my own gestures which is relational and I grow brain cells with my words which are vibrational and self-dialogue which is conversational so I become my own pharmacist in my own pharmacy inwardly I was playing with my DNA tangler thingamajiggy and I realized that a good chunk of the human brain is devoted to the hand we have lots of sensation in our fingertips and and so much of the brain is devoted to the hand and at the same time so much of society has been created by the human hand we wouldn't be able to actually create this without our hands so even if we had a thought of something even if we were the same but didn't have these hands we wouldn't actually be able to build anything that we thought about so thought is strongly tied to the human hand in a way or it could be that we have so many thoughts because we're not actually using our hands creatively we're only using them habitually and then I was wondering if playing with this which stimulates the hands while talking about stuff and thinking about stuff and self-dialogue would actually help to grow the brain in a way extrapolating and learning in this way plus doing this might be a type of brain cross training because the brain cells devoted to the hands are being activated at the same time as the brain cells that are growing through new thoughts new memes epimimetics endomimetics so in a way too it could possibly get those ideas into motion through the hands at some point in the future because at least the hands have been firing at the same time as these insights I have no idea if that's true but I just remembered that a lot of the human brain is the human hand and in a way everything's been created by the human hand so in a way that the brain is the human hand and what it's created but it also can create through just thinking and thoughts and it's no wonder that we feel good when we're using our hands because then we're not thinking so much because we're using our hands so using the hands would be very important and when 
that doctor talked about how a touch actually stimulates circulation in the other person due to this electron thing that happens. Well, if we think about how a lot of the human brain is devoted to the hand, we're actually really touching someone with our brain, a lot of our brain, when we're touching them with our hand. And then how does gesturing with the hands in a wave change the hand neurons in the brain? So if we're always just holding our hands like this, for the rest of our life, they're gonna get stuck like that, stuck like that in our brain too. Whereas if we're using our hands in a lot of different ways to wave, shake hands, hug, whatever else, then that's going to help our brain neuroplastically as well. I watched a TED talk by Anne Herman Nettie, and she was talking about how the brain turns things into autopilot wiring. And I was thinking about how it's it's good to turn certain things into autopilot like like driving or different skills like that, but interacting with life, interacting with other human beings, we don't want to turn that into autopilot. We don't want to turn those into efficiencies because that is like assuming we're interacting with a machine. And imagine if we could turn being super loving and kind into autopilot. So right now through our, our brain programs, we've turned separateness and division into autopilot, but what if we acted and responded to life with love? That requires not being on autopilot at all. But our autopilots have us stuck in habits that prevent us from connecting in those ways. And she says, the trouble with autopilot is that when things change, we get caught off guard. And that's kind of a silly statement in a way, because things are always changing. And then when we finally notice something changed, we're caught off guard. So noticing that something changed could actually be a good thing. It could be a clue that we got out of autopilot for a moment. And she gave the example of trying to learn to use the other hand and how that can be draining because those circuits haven't really been activated as much in the brain. Well, it's the same with map consciousness. We're trying to activate different circuits and they're higher energy circuits and it can be draining after a while being in that state of consciousness. So we do come back to ego consciousness, to habit consciousness, and we need to rest before we can move into that space again, into that space of infinite change, which Life is infinite change, it's just because we're caught in habits, we don't notice, we don't see it. It's all there, it's all changing. We can change which bits of information we make salient. And the only way to do that is by not being caught in habit at all. The brain is trying to learn how to use the altruism and love and compassion pathways. And it can be frustrating in this world that's not designed to mirror those pathways back to the brain. Autopilot is our personal view, it's our personality when we're not learning. She talked about how we have 7.4 hours of screen time a day or three months out of the year of screen time and another TED talk said we have 11 hours a day of screen time. Either way I was thinking about how the screen can be utilized to grow the brain in a creative learning mode or it can be used in order to put the brain in passive mode. So when the brain is in passive mode, it's off. It's pretty much sleeping. So for me, I'm using my screen for self-dialogue and then to edit the dialogue as well. And I also use the screen to type up some of the things that I want to talk about. And so in that way, I'm using it as an extension of my brain to grow my brain. I'm not using it that much for passive things. I don't really watch any TV except maybe once every month or two, I'll sit down and like spend a day watching movies 
on Netflix. But other than that, not really. So even if I watch a TED talk, I'm I'm actively engaged. I'm thinking of what I see from what they're saying. I'm thinking outside what they're saying, not just absorbing what they're saying. An example of autopilot would be, since I got my bidet, now autopilot gets me to pull the little lever to spray my butt, as opposed to reaching for the toilet paper. Now, that is something that is good to have as a reflex, as a choice of what I do. I don't want to actually do that in terms of things relating to humanity and the heart. If I don't talk about my TED Talk extrapolations right away, I sort of lose the flavor of what it was that I was extrapolating, slightly at least, so. Then I watched a TED Talk by Anthony Cheen, and he was saying, if we had a notification on our computer screen saying a new version of the software is available for download, we would download it, or if we didn't, eventually the computer isn't working as well. So the software download is in order to keep everything running smoothly. And I actually think Mania and Map Consciousness is a software download. It downloads the new software of the map of reality to move towards oneness and love. And Mania, in a way, ends when we've downloaded all that we can download. And then we come back down to the level of society, and then we have that download in order to have it as software to inform our lives moving forward. And that goes with harvest your mania. Harvest that software download that we were given. And just as weight training is to grow muscle, mania is neuroplastic training to change the brain, to see things in a different way. And we grow more brain cells and have more contacts so we can actually carry the universe, so we can actually move that world into manifestation. And he talked about accepting the terms and conditions of the download and how nobody reads it. And in a way, going into manic consciousness is accepting the terms and conditions of the download but not reading the rules. And so we download it and then we come back to this reality and we didn't read the rules. But in a way we can go back and we can harvest and we can understand some of the rules that we experienced in that other state of consciousness. So in a way, harvest practice and body is figuring out the terms and conditions that we were reading when we were in that state but since we're back from that state, we don't have the terms and conditions anymore. So we have to actually move towards creating those terms and conditions within our neurology. And I think that was one of the terms and conditions of the download is, I will be responsible for moving towards this in actuality. It probably says, I promise to act this way and embody this even when the energy wears off. And I understand that it's my job to co-create heaven on earth, even if other people can't see it or feel it. It's not just about watching lots of TV and creating heaven in the brain cells of the prefrontal cortex and being passively lulled into a waking sleep. And he said, make the conscious choice to deal with what's right in front of you. And this was just a quick statement he made. It wasn't something he was emphasizing. But my brain thought to itself, that's all we can really deal with is what's right in front of us. But we're so busy abstracting in our brains and we put that in front of us. And it's not real, so we can't actually deal with that. We can only deal with what is right in front of us. And then I was starting to think about things like, What's right in front of us is what creates our life and creates our brain. For example, a TV right in front of me versus going for a walk in nature and having that in front of me. That is going to change my brain. And even what's underneath us, we could have the dirt of the earth on our feet or we could be sitting on a couch. 
So what is in front of us and what is underneath us is partly what creates our brain. in the physical world, but we're so busy lost in our own mental world that we're not, we don't even really see what's really in front of us. But that's the only thing we can actually deal with is like what is right in front of us. But we can go on a path towards unfolding what we would like to be in front of us. But we can only do that by actually changing what's in front of us. We can't do that by rearranging thoughts in our brain. And by rearranging thoughts in our brain, we think we're doing something, but we're not. And I also thought of it in terms of aging. So if we always have a phone in front of us and, and then we're hunching forward and forward and forward and eventually we're stooped over and our vertebrae fuse because we're, that's what it does in order to prevent our head from falling between our feet. And that is going to age us. Or, as they say now, sitting is the leading cause of death. So if that's what's underneath us is a couch and what's in front of us is a TV, that is going to partly determine our longevity. And again, it's how we're orienting ourselves in the field of gravity. And even with things like, say, smoking cigarettes, why is this cigarette right in front of me? Why is this alcohol right in front of me day after day. If it's not in front of us, it can't affect us. Watching too much of the news, like why are we putting that in front of us? Why are we putting that in our awareness? Why are we putting that in our perceptual field? So mania tries to change what's in front of us. We can't sit still, we can't do the same thing. Everything is interesting. We're like a kid in a candy store. We're like one of those moths that can't look away from the light. We're interested in everything and we're just going everywhere. And by changing what's in front of us, we're changing our brains and we're seeing ourselves anew and feeling ourselves anew. It's spontaneous, it's random, it's synchronistic, it's intelligent. Why does that energy want us to put different things in front of us? It wants us to see different things. It wants us to experience different things. We've created our life by what we put in front of us. Mania changes our programmed habitual way of being, of going in circles, both physically and mentally, to being on a pathless path, a path with no path, it's a path of just perceiving moment to moment and seeing what that unfolds. And after the download is complete, sometimes we need to restart. And I watched a TED talk by Scott Ellie and I made a note of wondering how do we create with time? Because they say, how do you use your time? How do you spend your time? How do you create your time? How do you create with time? Because right now we're spending time, we're not creating with time. And in a way it's by what we put in front of us, even what we put in front of us in our perceptual field, through our mind screen, say jealousy perhaps, that's how we're creating with our time. We're creating jealousy with our time. We're creating hate with our time. We're creating anger with our time. That puts things into a different perspective than just saying, I am angry. I'm creating time with anger and each one of us has the same amount of time in a day. And people that are creating that time as anger are putting that into the field of space time that we all share. And that in itself is that level of consciousness and it's additive in that level of consciousness. I feel map consciousness is course correction software. It changes how we approach what's in front of us. And that's a good question. How do we approach what's right in front of us? I feel that map consciousness is intelligence trying to come online. And so an experience of mania would be 
exercising intelligence. And I thought of how a way to measure screen time is that if a person utilizes the screen and is able to extrapolate something, their own insights, not just recall what the person said, but see some kind of connection or some kind of higher thought from that thought, then it's not necessarily wasted time. It's actually time, time that has created something else. It's time that creates something new in our neurology or within our brain as opposed to passively absorbing what was already said. Somebody already created that sentence and said it. Now if we can create a new thought or word or sentence from what it is that we absorb and we can extrapolate from that, then time has just actually been amplified in a way because it's amplified in our brain. We saw something new and when we see something new, that's mirrored in our brains. And I feel like that is what could warp space-time, is when we see something new and that changes our brain. But if we're just seeing and absorbing and not actually extrapolating, not critically thinking or lateral thinking, then we're just actually we're not evolving consciously we're being used we're being drained we're not being creative so if a person says well I'm gonna watch two hours less TV a day and the TV that I do watch I'm going to extrapolate then it could actually be a vehicle to higher consciousness and, and brain cell growth as opposed to not. Because the thing with technology is we can access a lot more information. And, and I was watching some TED Talks that talk about how we don't actually change ourselves based on TED Talks or anything. And I think part of it is that we're not extrapolating. We're just smiling and nodding. Because we've gotten to this place where we think learning is just listening. When it's really actually seeing the beyond of what's being said. But we have been trained out of seeing the beyond. And every now and then we see the beyond, we're like, wow, I'm such a genius. Well, genius is being able to do that all the time. And I think the brain gets fatigued because we're not extrapolating. I could probably do this all day long and I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose energy. But when we're just passively absorbing, we're being drained. Whereas when we're making new connections, we're getting blood flow to our brain, extra blood flow, and that's going to give the brain energy. There's a difference between thinking with what somebody is saying and just listening. He also had a quote that said, when it gets ripe, you have to make it fall. And I would say sometimes it falls on its own, and that wasn't his quote, but I was thinking about how if a fruit falls from a tree, when it's ripe, someone can either pick it up right away and eat it, or it might actually grow a whole new tree. It might actually grow a whole new world, which is the tree. And I was thinking about how when the brain gets to that high point in mania and then it falls, it's almost like it's this ripened fruit and it can either get eaten or it can grow a new tree. I feel like our brains are seeds. They're seeds of consciousness. So when we 
get to that ripest point and then we fall back down. Now we're not just the fruit, we're the whole tree. What I'm trying to say is even as human beings on this earth, we think when we reach adulthood that that's our peak. That adulthood that we reach could just be a seed for a different level of humanity that we don't even understand yet. Because it's interesting, we get to that high point and then we fall, just like a fruit with seeds. And so I think when we fall back to this reality, we're seeds for that other reality. We have to move towards it. We're the seed, we have that whole tree, the whole blueprint of the tree within us and we can grow that tree. Right now what happens is that the pharmaceutical company just comes along and eats our fruit and our seeds never get planted. I watched a TED talk by Tom Akeser and he started with a Gandhi quote saying, the difference between what we're doing and what we're capable of doing would solve most of the world's problems. And of course, I extrapolate everything to map consciousness, to trans consciousness, and mania shows us the difference between what we're doing in our life and what we're capable of doing, or how we're capable of being as a human being. And it shows us how we're capable of seeing, how we're capable of seeing the world, what attitude we're capable of having, what perspectives we're capable of taking. And this was the guy that was talking about how TED Talks don't do anything to change people, really. And I actually feel like mania is an experience of embodying all the TED Talks without even having to think about it. So all that amazing research people are doing about all these different potentialities that human beings possess one goes into that state and is living that way in daily life and not as some super sports athlete that they had to work hard to be for 10 years in order to perfect the sport, but just automatically without trying to do anything like an act of grace and then being that way in daily life in one's daily actions without having to have any particular thing no motivation, no desire for anything in particular, not trying to do anything. And by not trying to do anything, one can do anything. Because by not forcing oneself into a single line of action or being or programming, one has access to the way by which one can deprogram oneself by just being intensely there in the present moment. And what does that even mean? It just means seeing. Seeing the present moment as the present moment from the perspective of the present moment as it arises, whatever arises as that. It's, it's sort of like what Krishnamurti calls choiceless awareness. Because one is not choosing anything, one is just very aware. If one has a motive, if one has made a choice about something, that means one cannot be aware of the rest of the field of reality. So by not choosing, by not having a motive, by not having a desire, everything is there. As it is because we don't need to desire in order for all to be there, here, right now. Mania shows us what we're capable of. It gives us a map of what we're capable of. And I remember how well I was able to rollerblade in that state. So I think, oh, am I supposed to do more of that? I think normal people need to listen to us and dance with us and follow our lead because we can lead people out of the programming it's not a matter of listening to TED Talks in order to get more programming 
It's not the answer. It's to see that we are programmed. Because when we can see, not only can we see everything, we can also see the programming. We're blinded by dopamine. We compare everything to that reflex. We compare everything to the dopamine program. Is this good? Is this bad? Will this give me pleasure? Is this part of my desire? And that in itself is dopamine. We don't need desire when we can see clearly because what we desire is to see clearly. We desire seeing, but desire prevents seeing. He gave an example of how there was this fish that fishermen used to throw as waste and then they changed the name of the fish from Patagonian toothfish to Chilean sea bass and when they changed it to Chilean sea bass it was then marketable for sale it was quite a scary looking fish so to make it desirable they changed the name so I was thinking in terms of so-called bipolar disorder if I call it transconscious altruism that would be something that maybe even normal people would want they might desire to be a visionary and people do desire to be a visionary and that's a visionary state so we've given it the wrong name and then from that it precipitates everything else and that's why I made my little stickers of transconscious altruist and I even put the writing in a font that makes it really hard to read so people either have to really try to read it or they're not gonna get it they're gonna actually have to see and part of that is how I define myself is going to have an impact on my life on how my life unfolds because he was saying he was saying we are who we think we are or the stories we have of ourselves so that's why I feel it's so detrimental for one to hold a story of lifelong mental illness in their hearts and minds he said how I define myself will change the way I live and we can only evolve our stories we have about ourselves so for me part of self dialogue is evolving the story that I have about myself and I don't even tell myself stories about myself but this will do it in my brain cells neurologically it'll change the way I see things because I'll have those brain cells so when something comes up I will see it in a different context I will see it in a different light and you talked about how in life we make predictions our mind makes predictions about things and we act based on our predictions well, mania is just like predictions amplified. So the, the mind already works in a predictive way. And then in mania, it gets to a point where maybe it predicts to the point where it's supposedly hallucinating or delusional or, or prophetic. And then we think, whoa, what's happening? Well, it's just a natural process in the brain turned on to a higher power. He said, who we think we are is why we do what we do. And that's true in terms of how now I don't feel I can work in the mental health system because uh, that's not who I am. And I feel the story that we tell about ourselves, that who we think we are, is part of how we can design a different game in reality. Mania shows us there is a different game in reality. It's the game of love and compassion. And he talked about something really interesting. He talked about there was an experiment done where people in virtual reality could decide to fly or not fly. And the people who decided to fly were way more likely to help other people in the real world. Think about that. Now in Mania, most people feel like a superhero at some point or they feel like they're here to save the world and all these things. They feel these altruistic feelings. Some people feel like they can fly or they might be able to fly. And this experiment shows that just allowing somebody to fly in virtual reality, meaning 
a gesture, a posture, an action that is equated to a superhero is going to make them more likely to come and help other people in reality. What is Mania doing? It's doing the same thing, but it's doing it for weeks or months at a time and a person is actually feeling like they are a superhero. So when they come back to reality, part of the point is to go and be a superhero even though one has come back from that virtual actuality feeling of being a superhero actually. It's giving us that feeling, it's giving us that posture, it's giving us that gesture of feeling like a superhero so we can feel how freaking good it is so we come back to this reality and we actually act that way. And the people in the experiment didn't know that was what they were testing for. So it was just those feelings inside, because they didn't fly for real, just the feelings inside that inspired them to embody the role of superhero in real life. And they had no clue. So giving people that experience in virtual reality made them more altruistic. Now, consciousness, the universe, can do the exact same thing in virtual actuality of mania, map consciousness, and then people come back, and that's why I feel it's really important to connect people with their altruism right away, because they were just in a state of feeling like they were a freaking superhero. And then they come back, and instead of saying, don't worry, you're a superhero, you're down and out right now, you know, you'll get re-energized and we're gonna get you back on the path of helping the world. No, they said, you're defective, you're diseased, you're, you're wrong, it's just crap. So again, map consciousness isn't a problem, it's a solution. I feel part of that experiment is that people feel powerful. If they feel like they flew, they feel powerful. And that probably activates these really high levels in the brain because they were able to do things that they didn't think they could do. And that's partly what map consciousness does. Even if a person doesn't try to fly or think they can fly, they're experiencing all these other things that they're capable of doing and increasing their power. If two minutes of a pose standing with your hands on your hips is going to make you feel powerful, try two months in a state where you feel you can accomplish anything. That's going to make a person feel powerful. But that power runs out, but we can still get back to us. It's imprinted in our brain. Look what happened to people with a, an experience flying in virtual reality. They didn't actually fly and then they are more altruistic. Mania and psychosis is trying to do the exact same thing. All the things we're trying to do in experiments and science, consciousness can do. We are that consciousness, so anything we try to do is mirrored within consciousness. Map consciousness allows us to actualize our potential, so then we can come back and move towards actualizing our potential, but not just for our personal selves, because a lot of us are out there in regular life actualizing our potential just for our own selves. And this state requires an altruistic brain. The missing piece probably to a lot of these TED Talk things and actually being able to live that way is altruism, because all those high capacities of humanity are not personal. They're not for personal gain. And personal gain, motive, desire, prevents it from being actualized. So trying to do it for a reason, like money or fame or all these things, is going to prevent it from happening. And you know, some people do get money and fame and all that, and then they get to the top and realize it's it's not all it was cut out to be because they're alone. And the thing with map consciousness is we actualize ourselves internally, subjectively, and then we come back here to do that in reality. Just like the people who flew in virtual reality, that was inner subjective, didn't actually happen, wasn't manifested, but then they come back to reality and they act in those other ways. The act of flying made them feel like superheroes in real life.
And I feel that's partly why it's important to tell oneself one's amazing stories of all the things one actualized within consciousness subjectively and partly objectively in life through the experiences of map consciousness is it's an equivalent of doing a power pose. It's, it's going back to that place where it's like, oh yeah, I was able to be that way and to remember how one was in that state and to eliminate those things that impede that from happening on a daily basis. So it's very important to change the story and that's why I've told myself a lot of stories and I've told myself a lot of different things in order to write over the story of just thinking that my brain is defective. It's altruist consciousness. It's oxytocin consciousness. We need to be altruists and not have motives that are separate from life. And he said, we become the stories we tell ourselves. And that's why it's important not to tell oneself the story of pathology. It's just a story.